good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. It's uh, my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Lars Rossen. Lars and I have worked together over a number of years on this initiative. It's my honor to serve as the chair of the forum at the moment, and I will keep my own introduction very briefly, simply to introduce Lars as a distinguished technologist and the chief architect of the IT for IT initiative at Hewlett Packard. Um, he was part of the inception of this initiative and has constructed the first version of the architecture. And um, he leads the initiative that aligns and integrates all of HP's management tools using IT for IT as the reference basis. He's been working on IT and service provider management systems for over 20 years and has a PhD in computer science, a master's in engineering, and an MBA in technology management. So without further ado, Dr. Lars Rossen. Thank you, Chris. So this session will be really why, what, and how uh, around IT for IT. So the abstract we sent out for, for this webinar was really, uh, as has been introduced here, uh, to describe what we've really been working on. Um, give an overview of IT for IT, what it offers, um, how you can consume it, and um, how you can use it in an IT organization, or if you're a consultant, or if you're a tool vendor, uh, it, it can give a lot of guidance and hopefully lead the industry to a better place than where we are today. The starting point for what we have been doing is really looking at uh, IT as it is today. It's um, the observation is that we have a broken chain. There's a lot of things that are quite problematic in uh, in IT today. We, uh, at the same time, are seeing a shift in the industry in how we are consuming solutions, like we are going more and more towards standardized solutions, if possible. Uh, the entire uh, concept of uh, a multi-supplier that uh, a single IT organization is not developing everything itself, but is actually um, consuming services from other suppliers implies that the area of IT management becomes problematic uh, or becomes more complicated. So buying standardized solution is great because it uh, puts down costs of IT, but managing it uh, the cost goes up. We um, we see that there is a number of existing solution framework or uh, general framework for how to to manage IT. Uh, the the most known one is is ITO uh, as a framework, uh, but there are other ones uh, out there. I listed a few on the slide here, but there are more than that. But the interesting part is that though they have a lot of uh, details on what you want to do on a process level, it does not really give a prescription on how to manage the uh, the service models and the life cycles, and as well as not giving prescription on how what kind of systems or components do you need to put in place and how do they interact. Another observation we had uh, was the fact that IT management fundamentally is industry agnostic. So. Most people want to believe that they're special, and the same goes with IT organizations. I've talked to many, and in general, they go out and, and state, well, we have a special situation, we have a lot of special problems in our organization, but uh, the more we analyze it, the more it turns out that everybody is really the same. So if you're in oil and gas, or if you're a bank, or if you're uh, in telecommunication, it really is the fundamental same problems you're trying to solve. And so it should also be possible to give a reference architecture for how to manage IT in a standardized way. It actually goes hand in hand with concepts of uh, TOGAF, which is also coming and managed to the open group of, you should really for each area uh, that you do IT for, have a reference architecture, a reference to be architecture. And IT itself is such an area, just like you would have it for uh, bank, uh, say accounts, uh, accounting, you would have a reference architecture for how an account system should look like. You can have that for IT. We did, of course, as part of that analysis, see that the, uh, the lack of such a standard really is driving up cost significantly. And that has been one of the driving forces. Is, and we have some examples for some of the early members of, of this work where just the simple thing of interfacing two incident management systems between a vendor and a, and, and a um, consumer of a service 
could take half year, full year to implement could cost uh, upwards of a million dollars to make such an interface to work. And fundamentally, it's just exchanging incidents. It shouldn't be an issue. It should just be plug and play, ideally, right? Uh, and if you go to ISOP, it doesn't really help you in describing how to do that. There is way too much wiggle room in how you actually arrange your incidents uh, within the ISO framework. So with that said, um, we, we started to look at what is actually going on in IT. And we also decided, well, it's not enough that we solve just the, the operational space of IT. Uh, it really starts at the planning side. There is uh, some business process modeling of whatever kind of uh, uh, business problem uh, the lines of business have. Uh, that leads to some demand being registered with IT. IT tries to translate that into requirement. Uh, projects are being created. Uh, they are being developed. Defects are being found. Uh, it becomes a request for change into operations. Uh, you start to monitor there's incidents and events and problems and maybe some kind of subscription being managed. And everything is linked together by processes, not by data, but by processes. Um, and everybody refer back to some kind of a service model uh, that says, well, this is the account receivable module that has an issue. But then people have to figure out what that is. What the, what does, how does that relate to conceptually what business was requesting originally, et cetera. And it turns out the traceability in, in this close to zero. And that's not just something I claim. If we go out to most of the organizations, they have that issue that you do not have traceability end to end in IT. You might have a little bit of traceability within some of the silos, uh, within the operation space, maybe within the development space, but end to end doesn't really exist. So what are we going to do? The first thing we, we looked at was uh, to say, well, essentially, running IT itself should be done the same way as you do any other business. And that implies that you should really look at it from what kind of methods would a business apply in order to become efficient. And one of the things that uh, many businesses look at is their production uh, uh, organized business, which IT really is. It, uh, it takes demand from from ex external sources like the lines of business, and then they produce services that is being delivered by IT. And so Porter uh, is, a, is a business guru, and he came up with um, the concept of value chain, and uh, it was initially mostly used by production uh, companies. And we looked at that and used that framework and said, what would that look like uh, within an IT organization? And uh, and the picture you see here, and there's a couple of different ways of, of, of doing that layout, uh, but the picture you see here of the value chain really highlights the, the essential part of it. The, uh, the value chain has four essential value streams in IT. They're called strategy to portfolio, requirement to deploy, request to fulfill, and detect to correct. And the rest of the pro uh, presentation will really be spent on outlining all the details of these four um, value streams, as they're being called. To support that, there's a number of supporting activities, uh, finance, sourcing, vendor management, intelligence, and reporting, etc. These are activities or supporting functions, some people call it that as well, which are really shared across all of the enterprise. So it's not IT-specific finance, it's not IT as its own, but IT needs to interact with finance as it's delivering its uh, value streams or implement the value streams. And by having that view into IT actually resonate a lot with business uh, leaders uh, when we talk to them about the IT for IT framework, that we put it into a business perspective. Each of these four essential value streams, they deliver value to IT and can be measured and they are interlinked. If we then dive into that in a bit more detail, the next step here is that we, we, we have these Four value streams that together uh, makes up IT. The first one, strategy to portfolio. It is really where you would drive the portfolio of IT. Uh, you figure out what kind of business innovation should IT support and making sure you have all the right strategies in place and prioritization in place to do the right thing in IT. That's also where you, at the end of the day, have the end-to-end reporting out of the state of the world, the state of IT. Then we have requirement to deploy. 
that's where we built capabilities for IT. So uh, essentially, when stuff has been agreed upon that this is uh, something to be uh, developed, something to be delivered by IT, you hand it over to a development organization. So the first part you would call plan, the next one you would call uh, build, and uh, once you have built a capability, you put it into production. So traditionally in IT, you would say plan, build, run. But here in IT, for IT we introduce the step in between, which we call request to fulfill. And that's because one of the things that we realize around IT is that in order to become a modern IT organization, it needs to change its form. It needs to be a service provider. All IT organizations today are transforming themselves or should transform themselves, some are not quite there yet, uh, into becoming service providers. They serve their lines of businesses. And that implies that, in essence, all the capabilities that have been developed should be put into a service catalog, be available for consumption by IT. You should also say that requirements to deploy, when you build something, you can also source something, and you could decide that it's not something you build yourself, but you get it from the sub supplier, or you get it from the cloud somewhere, and you put it into the catalog. And then when the lines of business really need an instance of that service, uh, they need a time tracking system, they need a, a oil planning application in place, they need a, um, uh, an account receivable module to be upgraded or changed or whatever, uh, it is done in request to fulfill. That's uh, a very expanded version of what traditional in IT is called change, change management. When request to fulfill is then pushing something into the data center to operations, then you will have run detect to correct, uh, which is the run part, uh, making sure everything is healthy, that it uh, gets uh, downgraded, upgraded, uh, monitored for performance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And if there are any issues that they are captured and, and dealt with, and problems are uh, are raised and set back uh, upwards, uh, back into requirements. So that's. That's the four value streams in IT for IT. So far, <clears throat> there's actually nothing really uh, mind-shattering about what we've been doing. The major change in IT for IT compared to uh, what you've seen or discussed before is, well, we're using a few new words, uh, but then it's the request to fulfill that consume part. So uh, plan, build, run has become plan, build, consume, run. Another thing that is introduced in our IT is to say, okay, we need to be much better at managing the actual service being delivered to understand what it is. And this is where IT for IT is going a little bit against what we see in ISIL. And we're not throwing away what is in ISIL. If you look at uh, organizations, what they've implemented, everybody uh, to some degree is trying to do ISIL version 3 or the, the latest uh, iterations of, of version 3. Uh, but in reality, on the service model, most organization is where ITIL version 2 was documented. So that is having a CMDB that kept track of uh, what is the realized service, the service running in the data center. Often uh, the CMDB in operation uh, is uh, populated based on discovery mechanisms. Right? So, uh, there's a long process going on before you get stuff into operations, but suddenly things pop up in a data center. You discover it uh, by some means, and then you populate your scheme to be, which is a very backwards way of doing it. I still do discuss uh, that this is not good enough. The concept of a CMS is around really having a full uh, change management system and, and managing uh, what is going to happen in the data center earlier in its phases. But in IT for IT, we actually take it one or two or three steps further ahead. So we really say you need to look at uh, services as uh, starting as a conceptual service model. The conceptual service model is essentially just describing what are the concepts you're delivering to the lines of business and attached to those concepts what are the requirements or the demands that the business has on the service? Business don't care about how it's implemented. Uh, they only care about what it's delivering. And at that stage, you don't care about the details of what does the APIs look like or the user interface looks like or anything like that. They care about whether you can do a, a mobile time registration or you can do a, an account receivable or, or stuff like that. 
you take that into the development cycle, the sourcing cycle, you know, to be, and what comes out of that, of course, part of the process of that, you are really creating what we term the logical service model. That is a model that describes what, how did I actually define this service? What is the logical service? What is the, uh, uh, would be describing how is the service actually constructed? Uh, what modules are part of it? Uh, what are the APIs that are available? What are the, uh, the way it can be consumed? But you can instantiate such a logical mo uh, model by actually installing the, uh, the service. And you might install it one place or several places, etc. Uh, and you might have several logical service releases that all comes, correspond to the same conceptual service. And then finally you get into the point of saying, okay, I take that logical service and I hand it into R2F. R2F will uh, deliver the service into the data center and instantiate the realized service model. Uh, that way you start to be able to create traceability all the way from conceptual to logical to realized and backwards again. I'm going to come more into the details as we, as we go, uh, go along this uh, presentation. So, uh, moving on from, from that, um, there was another principle we looked at when we started constructing IT for IT, and that is really to do a, a layered uh, analysis, starting with first a, a functional model to figure out what are all the functional areas that IT needs, that's uh, basically uh, looking at customer use cases, etc. Going on to a life cycle model, uh, where we look at the uh, what is the essential thing that happens uh, in terms of continuous assessment, continuous integration, continuous delivery around this service model and the life cycle of those service models. Then we went in and looked at the information model, which is figuring out what are the key controlling IT artifacts or data objects that uh, is part of managing the life cycle of, um, of services. And then finally, looking at what are the key integration points that will then happen within such a landscape that controls these information model objects. What we wanted to do is to create a normative standard, which is what we're doing in the open group, is to formalize the information model and this integration uh, area, because the top layer is what many of the other frameworks are doing a great job of, of, of trying to uh, advise IT around uh, what processes you want to use. You can use ISO, you can use COVID, there is a safe framework for development, uh, etc. But the underpinning system, what are the key controlling data models that you need to put in place that you use to exchange information between systems and between suppliers in the IT space. So if you look at that, we uh, we can then look at the how does this IT for IT really relate to some of these other uh, standards or framework we have in the industry that many of you love or use uh, on a daily basis. And the first one that most people ask around is ISO. And you could say ISO is essentially a best practice framework for IT processes and the taxonomy of IT. It's a good framework. It is primarily focused on the operational side of IT, not as much the planning and strategy part, even though it is part of the latest uh, standard. Uh, practitioners traditionally mostly use it in operations. Where IT for IT is a reference architecture for the IT software ecosystem, right? So it describes what is it that you would put in place in IT in order to manage IT itself. So it underpins ISO. If we take TOGAF, well, that's an industry standard architecture framework that describes how would you go about planning out and introducing uh, IT services. And in that sense, IT for IT is one of the libraries that TOCAS uh, say you should develop uh, for any area you want to, uh, to, uh, to manage, and IT itself is an area you want to manage. And finally, there is a specification language called Archimate, which is also uh, managed by the Open Group. It's a well-formed model language for uh, business services, and we have chosen 
in IT for IT to use Archimate as the formal language for uh, for the normative standard of IT for IT, which is also being aligned with TOGAF, so it all uh, forms a very nice uh, complementary set of things to look into. The ITER part is, is not a standard, unlike the other ones, um, uh, and is not part of the open group, and I would say there are competing things in, in the world around ITER, uh, but we do recognize that's very important for, for quite a number of IT organizations, so we make sure that we are reasonable aligned with that. Going from this, um, we go a little bit into the structure of IT for IT, and, uh, and here we say, well, in addition to the normative standard, as it is described, that we are creating, we also create a number of uh, guidance documents, which really describe, uh, and actually the, the purpose is twofold, it describes how typical uh, capabilities and, and uh, processes will interlink into uh, the IT for IT normative standard. So, as we will uh, see in the in the next uh, few slides, uh, we have concept of a component, like an application component in Archimedes, we call it a functional component, and a life cycle artifact or data object, that's part of the normative standard, but how that links into scenarios that is described in some guidance document, it's not normative, but it's a guide to how you can consume the reference architecture, and we have that for a number of scenarios like uh, agile development or, um, or how to do SLA management, uh, how to do IT financial management, uh, etc. Another important aspect of IT for IT is that we've decided to uh, develop it as a layered uh, structure. So there are five layers in the uh, in the IT for IT structure. Um, the reason for that is that we want to make sure that uh, two things basically that it's uh, um, consumable. Um, even if you're not a hardcore uh, architect, uh, IT architect, it should still be possible to consume it. But on the other hand, it should be precise and specific, which requires that we use a lot of the methods from from uh, from uh, uh, hardcore architectural disciplines. We should be sure that it's end-to-end -end, uh, complete, don't have gaps, that it really works end-to-end -end in IT. And if we go into all the detail of uh, specification that you can end up constructing in a language like Archimate, it might be difficult to actually uh, see the forest for all the trees, so to speak. So what we've uh, done is that we say at layer one, we have a, it's an overview layer. It's not the normative standard itself. It's an abstraction of the IT for IT that really allows you to talk about it in a single slide. You can have all the concepts of IT for IT in a single slide. We don't use any uh, formal notation language. We have a simplistic language we use for it with only three different symbols in it, so anybody can learn it in five minutes. And I will show it uh, next slide. Um, then we have a layer two where we go one layer deeper. Each of the values being requires a full slide, um, and we start talking about the flow of data information, etc. And then layer three is where the real uh, hardcore uh, normative standard is specified in Archimate. It's uh, it's fairly comprehensive, so it's not easy to uh, to just grasp uh, at at the day one. Uh, but you can drill into that. And then you say the last two layers, four and five, they become vendor specific. Uh, we realize that uh, detailing something out into the nth degree of accuracy will take forever and would actually hinder the industry in adaptation. So we say uh, layer one, two, three will be formalized in the own group. Layer four and five will be for each vendor. But because of layer three, they will be able to interoperate. So let's look at uh, IT for IT at the uh, uh, layer one. And so first, a couple of, of uh, symbols here. As I said, there are really uh, three uh, symbols. Uh, the circle, black circle, that's a data object or key data object. Um, we've identified uh, a small set of uh, key objects, uh, about, I think it's 33 key objects in total, that uh, really controls all of IT into it. And they are, they are listed in, in, in this. There are the blue squares. These are functional components. They are the essential components you need to put in place in order to manage IT. Each functional component should be controlled one key artifact. 
so it becomes a minimum. You can't really decompose that component further uh, without spoiling some of the traceability. So typically, you would you would buy and, you know, or implement at least uh, a, a full functional component at a time. And then there is the uh, the black line, which is just stating that uh, there is a relationship between these uh, or a generic relationship between these components. So, for instance. A, uh, an incident can be related to a problem and vice versa. A similar, and an event can be related to an incident and, and vice versa. Uh, if you go further down in the specification, we have cardinality, etc. Uh, but at level one, these are the only three things we have. Some of the key uh, data objects are the ones that actually keep track on the real service model, the model of what IT delivers to the business. And they have a slightly different color, as you can see at the bottom. Um, so the configuration management component will um, contain uh, data objects that represent the actual services being delivered to the uh, to the business. So configuration items, in essence, in, in old CMDB speak. And so if we drill into the four value streams, uh, strategy portfolio has uh, five uh, functional components. Um, Controlling in total six uh, key artifacts. Uh, so at the at the bottom you would see the service portfolio component. It's a pretty important one. It keeps track on all the conceptual services that IT deliver, and also what is here in terms of the conceptual service blueprint, which is uh, essentially saying, well, what are the uh, phases that the conceptual service go through? So we have a version one of a of uh, say a time tracking system, and then uh, uh, we have a version two of the time tracking system, which have more business features delivered. Maybe a business wanted it to be mobile accessible, and that would come into version two itself. Then there is the portfolio demand component, which keeps track on all the backlog items that the businesses are requesting. So essentially, it's uh, equivalent to business demand coming in that is being managed there. Then there is the proposal component, which keeps track on what is named the scope agreements, which essentially are the IT projects that are being kicked off. So it's the contracts that that the the uh, the IT CIO office or the planners uh, uh, allocate a budget for, and says, okay, we want this to happen, and it's handed over to uh, to requirement uh, to deploy to actually be developed. And of course, that relates to the backlog items because it's essentially specified as a collection of backlog items that we decided, yes, we're going to do it. And they are, again, related to what conceptual services to be delivered. And then, finally, there is the policy component, which keeps track on all the uh, the uh, policies that IT lives under. They will be related into which conceptual service needs to follow those policies. And, and the enterprise architecture component which are your traditional Sparks, EA, or a similar kind of systems that would uh, keep track on the service architecture of the business services that these IT uh, services will underpin. So, of course, again, they relate back into the conceptual service. So these are the five things you need to put in place in order to actually be able to manage IT to keep track on what is IT delivering. And the reality is that most IT organizations today do a very poor job of actually doing this. Moving into requirements to deploy, there are more things in play here. So essentially there is, um, I have to quickly count here, nine components, eight, nine components. There is, uh, at the bottom, again, there is a service design, uh, which is where you start designing the service and the release composition component, it's difficult to read the end here, uh, which is where you keep track on what are the composition of the things you release out. And then you have the usual things, you have requirements, you have defects, you have test cases, you have source and builds and, 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 and build packages. And I can't have time today to go into the details here. I need to have time for Q&A. The important part is the IT project uh, or IT initiative, sorry, that is being maintained by the project component. That's where uh, essentially uh, the, the budget is handed over to and a project manager will make sure that, that all of the things that happens in RCD is actually uh, being delivered on time. Whether it's agile or whether it's a waterfall or any other kind of process you're using, you can actually do it using these sets of components. 
The next one is request to fulfill, and that's the new one, the new kid on the block. There's a lot of, of names in here that would not sound familiar uh, to uh, all of you listening into this uh, presentation. Um, the essence here is that we are transforming IT into becoming a, a service provider, which implies that you need to have a consumption component where you can go in and shop for what you want from IT. And some of the things that are very difficult to get your head around uh, initially is that IT itself is a consumer of IT. So if you need another virtual machine for R&D, you should be able to go into a consumption catalog. And, and with the profile of a developer, you should get a, a virtual machine for that. If you are a, a person responsible for delivering, um, an IT person responsible for delivering mail service in a region, you should be able to go in and allocate uh, machines for um, uh, uh, an extra exchange server installation or even allocate the software uh, that you need to put into production. Um, in order to do that, you need to manage the, the offers that you can do. Uh, you need to uh, understand how is the composition of the offers. And then the very important component here is the fulfillment execution component, which is the one that actually figure out how to, uh, to deliver it. And the implementation of a fulfillment execution component can be an, a system that just keeps track on the manual things you're going to do. So kind of in line with a traditional change request process, or it could be fully automated cloud-oriented way of saying, I just press the button and it'll do everything completely automated. And then also associated with request to fulfill is keeping track on what is then actually the usage and then uh, doing the showback, chargeback uh, to whoever is consuming that component. There's lots more information about this uh, value stream in the detailed documentation. Uh, and again, I can spend an, uh, a couple of hours explaining the details of what goes on here, but it's a very important new thing in IT for IT compared to what you're used to. The final one is detect to correct. Here, most people will feel at home because essentially these are the components you need to put in place in order to manage the things that are running in IT. You have a configuration management system where, or component where you keep track on what are actually the services you have running. Um, changes there is controlled by change control with RFCs. Uh, you have service monitoring of it. Uh, you have an event uh, uh, component that keeps track of everything that happens. Uh, you can manage incidents, uh, problem known errors. Uh, you uh, have to be able to manage service levels. Um, and that is the executable part of service levels. They actually come to life much earlier in the life cycle. It's a full guidance document around how that works in the IT for IT standard. And then the, the run book automation component. And so if you take all of that and put it together, you get this picture. And this is uh, what you see if you put it all together. There's one important thing is that at the bottom, you sort of have a line going through with, with all the uh, purple circles. Uh, and you start with the conceptual service, becomes the logical, then it becomes what you actually release, then it becomes the desired service that you want to put into production, and then finally what you actually have in production. So that line with, with the various stages of the service definition is what we call the service backbone. And that is what uh, gives you traceability. So you can go all the way from a conceptual service or a scope agreement or a portfolio backlog item and figure out what was actually done, where is it in the development, uh, what is which data center has uh, installations of this, in which versions, how many incidents are actually being created on which versions of that conceptual service. So suddenly, if you have this in place, you can actually have true traceability in IT. And with that, I'm coming to the end. Um, essentially, in summary, IT for IT is not uh, trying to replace anything out there. It's complementary to existing frameworks, but it, uh, it addresses something that didn't exist before, and that is a prescriptive reference architecture for how to run IT itself. We believe it's very robust. We have tested it out, so it's not even though the standardization is just being finalized in its, in its first release now. Uh, we have uh, a number of uh, 
uh, IT department that are following the IT for IT uh, framework and has used it for implementing solutions. We have tested it against the latest trends in terms of, say, uh, uh, agile and DevOps. Uh, we actually, within my organization, we have reference implementations of pretty much everything in the uh, reference architecture. So it, it, uh, it's a very uh, doable thing. It works. Uh, so it's not just a theoretical piece of work that we have been working on for four years. Um, it's ready to be consumed. Many thanks, Lars. Um, I think we've we've all struggled a bit with the audio, so Simon and I will address that later on. So um, many thanks to all for their perseverance. With Lars's final slide up, I'd like to respond to the question that said that the relationship between IT for IT and ISIL is important, um, but what about the relationship with Archimate and TOGAF? I think the thing to point out about one of Lars's slides is that it doesn't compare apples with apples. I mean, the point that we're trying to make here is that some of the um, understandings of IT for IT mask its rather deceptive simplicity. Um, there is a complementarity, a very strong complementarity to ITIL, but what we are not doing is competing with or anything else in relation to TOGAF or Archimate. What we've done as good citizens of the open group, if you will, is built IT for IT using TOGAF and our representation of it uses the Archimate language. So the slide that Lars is just running back to now, thank you Lars, um, the top level comparison is a true comparison. Um, the other two pieces are highly informative, but uh, jolly good question. So that's the first one. Um, let me go up. Um, another question that was raised was that the word layer is a bit misleading. I mean, I'm inclined to agree. Um, what we have is a sophisticated leveled abstraction. So we have five abstraction levels. And again, the power of this is actually much more sophisticated than it first seems because the abstraction la levels moving downwards enable us, without being dependent on any process model, to enable vendors like CA, ServiceNow, IBM, Microsoft, HP, and the others that are already in the forum to conform to the standard and demonstrate the compliance of their products. So that is something new and powerful, a prescriptive architecture, a prescriptive standard that can be conformed to right down to the product level. And then we can also go upwards. So the value of abstraction levels moving up is we can articulate this, as Lars has demonstrated, to CIO and CIO plus one levels in language which is conceptually consistent with the standard, but without overwhelming them in the down-in-the-weeds detail that's obviously need to make the CMDB work and make everything integrate to deliver the services in the value streams. So again, the comment that layer is a bit misleading, um, I would take that one on the chin. Um, these are abstraction levels. Um, a question was asked, IT software ecosystem, is there applicability to telecommunications and IT infrastructure, data centers, extract, etc.? The answer to that is a qualified no. We are dealing with the business of IT. This is various labels in different parts of the world and the, the business, but what we're looking at is the business of IT. In other words, that specific area. And, and I would like to add to that, Go ahead, Lars. In, in, in the terms, uh, I, I, in, in my past life, I've worked a lot with the telecoms industry. You could say a lot of telecoms is uh, today in a transformation to become uh, managed service providers, so they become more and more IT organizations. And in that sense, a lot of telecoms can actually use this as well. There's also another thing. I've, I've looked at ETOM, which is the uh, framework for uh, telecoms, so to speak, uh, it's, it's uh, managed by the uh, uh, telemanagement forum, and uh, and there are uh, ideas from that that has migrated into to this framework. So the concept of of uh, of consumption, the request to fulfill, and the concept of of having a layered way of 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 
presenting it uh, can be uh, traced back to Etom. Uh, so we so we do have some uh, some degree of of understanding of what goes on there. Absolutely. So I would I would um, underscore Lars's uh, elaboration there by uh, characterising, if you will, the IT for IT initiative as a long overdue perception of. Um, IT service management as its own industry vertical. And what we've been able to do with the leveled abstractions is to accommodate the learnings from other standards in other industry verticals to truly appreciate the space that this can occupy in the frameworks and standards landscape out there. So we were also asked a question about performance metrics in enterprise architecture and work products such as the ones that are articulated in TODAS. Our response to this is in the um, substantial guidance material that comes with the reference architecture. So just to give you some background, we have almost 50 organizations actively contributing to the collateral that you've seen Lars introduce today. Um, one of them is Westbury Software, who are in the business of performance measurement and management. Um, and we have an active work group which is developing KPIs which provide the full insight from the models that Lars has introduced. So again, there's um, a huge benefit in our involvement with the Open Group in that we can draw that, if you will, structural need from TOGAF and deliver it through one of our own work groups within the forum. But um, a great question there. Again, bear with me while I scroll up. So, so uh, while you scroll up, I, I picked out um, a, a question here, or two questions. Uh, the, the first one is, can you implement IT for IT incrementally? Very much so, that's our, uh, what we recommend uh, all our customers and, and typically how you would run projects. We typically see that people start looking at the detect to correct area uh, and, and implement uh, uh, some of the functional components uh, around incident event uh, monitoring, etc., and then move out from there uh, to to other parts. So you can definitely do it incrementally, and it's not a rip and replace. Uh, very often, existing systems you have in place can be made part of it. So typically, the first thing you would do is to map your existing landscape into IT for IT, and then you would discover you can use it as a way of discovering how your to be uh, architecture. Uh, could be based on your current as-is architecture. Uh, that is, uh, what uh, systems do you already have in place? Uh, a lot of overlap typically takes place in most organizations, so it becomes a good backdrop for that. Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> thanks very much, Lars. Um, just, just to elaborate a little further on that, I mean, the, 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 the real power of this leveled abstraction that you see on the slide in front of you, um, to extend Lars's comments a bit, is this work is completely process model agnostic. So we were asked whether or not this would accommodate Deeming's work of PDCA and so on and so forth. The answer is absolutely yes. This is sufficiently agnostic at the process model level to accommodate anything from waterfall to DevOps and so on. And that is um, the swappability, if you will, the, this approach to um, building the collateral and these upwards and downwards abstractions that you see indicated by Lars's arrow on the right-hand side of the slide makes this truly unique and definitely a space filler in the landscape at the moment. There's one question here, Lars, I'm going to direct to you to, um, because you're in a much better place to answer it. We were asked, what do you mean by a realized, in quotation marks, service model? Right. Uh, so some people also call it a physical service model. So really what we are talking about is the model of what you are actually running in your data center, something you have turned on um, or at least put available in the data center so it's, um, it can serve uh, customers. Uh, so it's traditionally what you go out and have in your CMDB 
uh, or CMS systems uh, and, and populated typically by a discovery. Um, and, and so physical doesn't refer to the fact that it should be uh, uh, the machines as opposed to the application. It just means that it is something that now has been realized. It no longer is in planning or testing state. The, uh, it relates to, uh, slightly relates to another question was, uh, I, I, I see there was a little bit of discussion about does it also uh, include uh, machines and chips and what have I? <laughs> um, and, and yes, it does. The service model will, uh, when you model what you you are actually putting in the data center, you need to go all the way down to the, the actual hardware. Uh, so the idea is that IT for IT was managed uh, from the business service level as all the way down to the physical machinery that, that uh, it's all running on top of. Uh, of course, if you give, uh, have an IT organization that relies on, on cloud services to deliver a lot of it, some of that would be abstracted away from you, uh, but uh, we, are, we are not precluding ourselves from, from also managing the physical world. Wonderful. Okay. Um, we have a related question, which I'll um, initially respond to, but then bring you back in again, Lars. Is the, the question was, can you define what you mean by life cycle level? And then the supplement was life cycle of what? My response would be it's a, an end-to-end -end overview, um, soup to nuts, as we would say in the USA. Um, but in terms of the specific perspective, the life cycle perspective of IT for IT begins from the value chain in the four value streams. And the reference architecture is sufficiently rich with the functional components and everything else prescriptive required to um, design and choreograph all of that activity is rich to support that whole of life cycle. Um, do you think that's a reasonable response, Lars, or would you care to add anything? No, I, I think it's a, it's a reasonable response. Uh, Very good. That there is always things that can be evolving more, and when it comes to the service model and the life cycles of services, uh, there are still further work that we are currently doing looking into what other standards are doing here. There are uh, interesting standards uh, like Heath in OpenStack and uh, um, TOSCAP um, in, in Oasis, um, for instance, and, and we don't want to replace them with something else. We want to make sure we have pointers to them and, and align to those things. There was a, a question around how we relate to uh, uh, some of the work that is going on uh, by from the UPDM uh, uh, group in, in OMG. Uh, I, unfortunately, I, I don't know all the details of all the relationships we're doing. It the the, uh, the work that we have in IT for IT is is, is growing uh, uh, dramatically over the past year, but we do have relationships into. Uh, uh, the OMG, and we are looking into how we can standardize the uh, the representation of uh, of Archimate and related things. We use an extended version of uh, with some UML part as well in 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 the detail spec, um, and making sure they exchange formats for that from OMG. I don't know the UPDM uh, program in particular, um, so uh, so I, I hope I sort of answered that one. Yes, indeed. There are some more specific ones. I'll just take one more. Um, are there already models available in, um, in in some of the commercial modeling tools, FlyMaker, Truth, uh, uh, etc.? And, and 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 yes, there are uh, some of the people working in the IT for IT group that have implemented uh, versions of it. Uh, right now, within the IT for IT group in OMG, we have used the, the Starks uh, EA Enterprise Architecture tool for representing Archimate, but we are trying to find a, a an open source tool that is strong enough to be able to uh, to capture all of it, um, uh, to not put any favor of any particular vendor. Um, but I expect that uh, pretty much every of the uh, major modeling tools will have a, uh, a version included very soon. Wonderful. Many, many thanks, Lars, for a, a splendid presentation, and, and thanks to you and those uh, in the, the the webinar for persevering with with um, less than optimal audio. Um, I'd like to bring the uh, the session to a close now. Many thanks for your participation.